you were born with some type of uh, a deformity, then you were a target. Down syndrome, you are a target. Your parents, if they're alcoholics, you are a target. If you're poor, you were a target. Throughout the 20th century, 33 states instituted sterilization programs. About 65,000 people were sterilized in America during this time. I had been sterilized, you know, um, got it open like a hog, if you want to call it. How did America get to the point of compromising thousands of individuals' rights through forced sterilization? The idea of eugenics first came from Britain where Sir Francis Galton used the term to mean well-born. Galton wanted to improve the human race by selectively breeding positive traits which he believed were the cause of the upper class's superior social standing. Though Galton's dream never came true in Britain, his ideas quickly spread west to America. And he advocated for getting involved in who reproduces and who uh, doesn't and uh, trying from that to create a better uh, human race. It's really this idea that you can do with people what you can do with animals, meaning you can kind of select out um, a particular positive strain and breed it the way that we might do with cattle or other animals. In 1873, Galton wrote, An improvement in the nurture of a race will eradicate inherited disease. Consequently, it is beyond dispute that if our future population were reared under more favorable conditions than at present, both their health and that of their descendants would be greatly improved. However, this practice of positive eugenics in Britain was not emulated by their American counterparts, as they instead focused on negative eugenics. This negative eugenics begins to take hold in, in certain parts of America, and one of the proposed solutions was eugenic sterilization, because if you want to stop people from reproducing, that's really the you know best way to do it. In the case of men or women, you do an operation that makes it literally uh, impossible for them to have children. The early American eugenics movement began in Indiana when they passed a law legalizing sterilization of prisoners in 1907. In 1909, California passed its eugenics law leading to over 20,000 sterilizations in the state. Many states then followed after 1911 with the creation of the Eugenics Records Office in New York. Most of these states created these laws on the premise that certain social ills were passed on through the family's genetic history. Perhaps the most significant of these early state eugenics programs was in Virginia. In 1924, a young woman named Carrie Buck was deemed feeble-minded by the Virginia state government and was admitted for an involuntary tubal ligation after being told that her operation was an appendectomy. In 1927, a conflict between Carrie Buck and the Virginia state government arose over the legality of involuntary sterilization. In an 8-1 decision, the Supreme Court upheld the Virginia law which allowed for sterilization, establishing it as a constitutional practice. In the Buck v. Bell majority opinion, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, It is better for all the world if, instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. And the reason it's important is partly because after this decision, a lot of states who didn't have sterilization laws before then started passing them, so North Carolina kind of comes along in that second wave. Though the eugenics movement was initially created for the betterment of the American gene pool, it was later justified for economic reasons. Since many people with the so-called undesirable traits were having lots of children, it was a large strain on the welfare system. The government saw sterilization as a way to reduce the number of people living on welfare benefits. This was the case in North Carolina after the passage of the Revised Sterilization Act in 1933. The law basically creates a eugenics board which has five members and they basically get to decide over all the eugenic sterilization petitions that the state gets. After World War II, many states ended their eugenics programs because of its ties to Nazi Germany. North Carolina, however, expanded their program by allowing social workers to issue sterilization referrals. This was unlike all other states, which only allowed doctors to refer their patients. The efforts of these social workers drastically expanded the program, ultimately leading to the sterilizations of over 7,600 people in North Carolina.
I mean, it was just controlling the masses, for want of a better word. And North Carolina gave unprecedented power to its um, social workers to go out and, and target people um, and, and push them and push them and push them till, till they submitted to these operations. They got my grandmother to sign the papers. How they coerced her into signing, signing papers is they threatened to take away her food stamps or her welfare. And my grandmother, you know, she had all these kids in the house and she needed that. Another reason why North Carolina was one of the last states to end its eugenics programs was because its supporters were powerful and persistent. In 1947, James Gordon Haynes and Clarence Gamble created the Human Betterment League. This organization recruited thousands of members and spread eugenics propaganda throughout the state. One brochure they distributed labeled people as morons and feeble-minded and said, these people cannot be expected to provide good heredity, a normal home, or intelligent care. So then it shifts to this goal of trying to limit the number of women, uh, of children that women who are on welfare have. In addition to threatening victims, doctors would often understate the severity of the patient's sterilization surgery. Sometimes they would blatantly lie to their patients about the type of surgery that was being performed. Victims of sterilization were mainly lower class women who had no idea what was happening to them or who had no choice in the procedure. My son was born by cesarean birth. I have no idea why they gave me a cesarean. I didn't, but now I'm thinking that they did it so they could sterilize me at the same time. So they took my baby out of me, and while they had me got it open, they went on and sterilized me. I didn't realize that I had been sterilized until I was 19 years of age. It was not until the late 60s and early 70s that eugenics in North Carolina began to die down. Um, so it really took the civil rights movement and a new appreciation for individual rights. So at the very same time at which there is an appreciation for the fact that this might really violate individual rights, there's also the development of the very first generation of the birth control pill, which is in the late 60s. And so there are other ways now um, to controlled childbearing. For a long time, the eugenics history of North Carolina was largely hidden. It was in the papers. I mean, it was hiding in plain sight, and they were sterilizing the story. So nobody knew just how aggressive the program was and how they bullied people into these things. It wasn't until Dr. Johanna Shun uncovered the North Carolina sterilization records and the Winston-Salem Journal began to publish articles about eugenics that the realities of this movement came to life. In 2002, the governor publicly apologized for the role that the state of North Carolina played and began working to compensate victims. Tom Tillis, one of North Carolina senators, worked with the newly founded North Carolina Office of Justice for Serialization Victims to draft a bill for compensation. The first check was sent out in 2014. No money is ever going to replace what happened to him, but money is the way we settle scores in this country. Sterilization was a compromise of individual rights by the government. The manipulative and sometimes illegal nature of the sterilizations violated a person's right to their own body. They were lied to so many times. They were just giving a, just a very vague understanding of what it was and um, often told that it was reversible, which these were radical tubal ligations that, were, that are not reversible. It's when you try to stop a group of people from reproducing, that's genocide. So yeah, this was genocide. It is a genocide and it is a violation. These people thought that society would benefit more if we were not even here. American eugenics cannot be forgotten. This is one dark spot in America's history of violating individuals' rights. The Buck versus Bell decision, which allowed state governments to create forced sterilization laws, has not been overturned. Until we formally recognize the unconstitutionality of eugenics, our troubled past continues to live on in the present.